All right, there's a real simple answer to this question. Yes? And that's probably all I'm gonna do before getting into spoiler territory. But yes, I do think this film broke the video game curse and I did enjoy it quite a bit and I'd recommend that you go see it. But let's face it, you probably already have. If you can, I'd recommend you go see it with a partner. There were a lot of couples in the showing I went to and it's a very loving, very romantic atmosphere. It'll reinvigorate your relationship, so... Yeah. Anyways, I've not made it a secret that I had a lot of grievances with the idea for this film in the lead up to its release. I made a whole video about the announcement trailer which basically shows off the whole first scene. And although I tried not to watch them, the other marketing materials that I saw didn't get me that excited either. If you didn't see that video I made and don't want to go back for it because it was a little rambly, my basic concerns with it were what the story would be, because Mario doesn't really have one past. I'm a seven a princess, I'm a jump of the mushroom, I'm a bit of the Bowser, woohoo! <laughs> that the animation won't look as nice as everyone was saying, that the voice acting won't be good, that the film would be stuffed with a lot of lazy references and overt fan service. Basically, my cynic brain was on full alert about this. And I don't think I was wrong to be like this necessarily, considering how video game adaptations usually are, how animated films are made today, and how modern movies in general tend to be. But I can happily say that this film proved me wrong, and I'm going to be going over how it accomplished all those things, as well as some other good points too. But I'm not saying that this film is perfect. There are definitely problems, and I'll be sure to go over those as well. But let's start off with my biggest concern of the plot. At its most basic, the story is that Mario has to save the Mushroom Kingdom from Bowser. As seen in the first trailer, Bowser steals the Superstar, apparently the power-up and not the other item, and plans to marry Princess Peach a la Mario Odyssey, or use it to destroy the kingdom. Mario only gets involved when he and Luigi are transported from their home in Brooklyn, where they're just regular plumbers as seen in that other trailer. And while Mario ends up in the mushroom fields outside Toad Town, Luigi goes to a mansion homage forest and gets kidnapped by Bowser. So saving Luigi and the whole world is the name of the game, and Mario alongside Peach and Toad go on a little adventure to do just that. This kind of story is probably one of the only things you can really do with Mario as far as a film narrative goes, which is probably why it was used in a lot of the cartoon episodes and the 1993 film. But this really isn't such a bad thing. It's not really the characters that help the story along because there's very little overarching development. But what keeps everything along going smoothly is really the pacing. The film is an hour and a half, but it felt quite a lot quicker. Not in a way that so many elements were being stuffed into a small time frame, so it felt like watching a PowerPoint presentation with a really over-eager clicker, but in a way that the film just felt so smooth. Like skating on a relaxing frozen penguin planet smooth. Up until the climax, the film retains an interchanging A and B style structure. So the film starts off with Bowser, then goes on to Mario in the real world, then to Bowser's plan, then to the Mushroom Kingdom, so on and so forth. This even leads to cool little moments like the introduction to Toad Town and how it's all organised and metropolitan sitting underneath Peach's castle, contrasting with the chaos and the anarchy of Bowser's troops. And every scene felt like it served a purpose, whether to set something up, continue the plot, or have a little extra character moment in it. There are no weird deviations, no overly long unfunny comedy sections or confusing jumps around. Well, except for the weird existential luma, which was probably the worst part of the film for me, but at least it took up only about a minute of the runtime. All of this might be because it is made for children, so it tries to keep everyone on board and following the plot train for like the whole thing, but it does make for a pretty good viewing experience. It's not so fast that you can't process anything, but it's not a slog either. Some scenes probably could have done with a, just a little bit more breathing room, but it's fine how it is now. Because of all of this, the plot felt so natural and so focused that I didn't really think at all about how linear or simple it was and actually had to be reminded of my complaint about it whilst I was planning for this video. I did mention the characters earlier and I think this is a good time to discuss that. The cast of Super Mario is essentially a collection of personalities. Mario is the straight and narrow hero, Luigi is a coward, Wario is, well, Wario, Bowser Jr. is a rascal, etc, etc. 
Point is, characters like these don't lend themselves too well to development and growth, because there really isn't any need for it in a game about jumping around. But since a film needs that kind of arc, the film is forced to struggle with whether the emotional core is going to be Mario believing himself so he can become a hero, or Mario and Luigi's brotherliness. The first scene in the real world introduces both, creating a weird contrast where, one minute, Mario struggles with his former boss and his family over the... Excuse me. Mario struggles with his former boss and his family over the decision to start their own plumbing business. And if it's a good idea for him to bring Luigi down with him into an unrealistic dream. And the next would having fun with the toads. Despite how contrived the setup to his arc scenes, and I'll admit, the extremity to which they're both professional failures and how most of his family, mainly his dad, just don't support him is a bit ridiculous. But despite that, that story does actually get carried out, with him getting shut down by the princess as not important when they're going to set off, and him going through a failing montage on a level style training course. And after he defeats Donkey Kong in a hard fought brawl, you would think that's when Peach starts to respect him and their relationship goes from there. Except the two have already gotten along before, and Peach was clearly worried about him during that fight. And although Mario does have a moment of doubt in the end, it's realising that him and Luigi are strong together which mirrors the start that's kind of the main emotional moment of the climax but it's hard to feel like their relationship is so important overall because for a large section of the film Mario doesn't really mention Luigi and stopping Bowser becomes more of the goal rather than rescuing him since near the end the main group is made up of Mario Peach Toad and Donkey Kong I think there was a missed opportunity to have Luigi around for at least a little bit to get him involved in some of the action and have a little bit more time of the characters were actually supposed to care about interacting especially because a lot of Mario games have these four as the main team. Talking about the characters, the two I really want to bring up are Princess Peach and Bowser, both for pretty similar reasons. I think the film mostly keeps characters balanced so that they can be a little funny while staying likeable and not annoying, but these two roll the line a lot more for me than the others. I think Peach really walks well between being potentially an obnoxious character that makes Mario feel obsolete in his own film, considering how she does dismiss him at the start and the little mention that she was able to do the obstacle course all in one go from the start. Sure, she has lived in the Mushroom Kingdom Hall of Life, which is the explanation basically given in the film, but if the Toads are so innocent that none of them can stand to fight against Bowser, how they taught her to do all of this escapes me, but that doesn't really matter. A few little lines were annoying, but I did like Peach, and I think she stayed a strong enough character all the way through to where she's probably not going to annoy anyone once you get settled into the film. I think they even handled the Mario-Peach relationship well, as it's heavily implied through a few of their interactions and in Bowser's jealousy, but the idea isn't shut down, and we sort of leave off on the idea that their relationship is starting to develop. Up. So, a sequel? Maybe? The end credit scene, which, spoiler alert, is just a hatching Yoshi egg, makes it seem like there might be. And, you know, I wouldn't be opposed to it. Like I said though, Bowser walks a similar but completely different line. I'm not the first to complain that a lot of films marketed to kids in recent years, particularly ones by the Big Mouse Corporation, tend to have very underwhelming villains that are either not actually the bad guy, or have all the luster taken out of them by being more pathetic than threatening, if the script even wants to pretend that they're supposed to be intimidating in the first place. But I think Bowser here really walks a good line, and I can imagine he'd still be a pretty effective villain if you were a child. Bowser does definitely have his goofy moments like he does in the games, but every character takes him seriously as a threat all the way up to the end, and the amount of times he drops kill and die bombs was almost enough to shock me, until you remember Nintendo is a company founded on mass murder and selling it to kids. I was originally just as doubtful about what Jack Black's performance would be like as everyone was about Chris Pratt's, but since after a while I got perfectly used to Pratt's voice because only his worst voice lines were in the trailer, I also thought that Bowser's voice, while leaning more towards the silly side and it does make for good comedy scenes, he managed to keep it together and gave a pretty solid performance overall. Even the Peaches song was very good and probably would have made me laugh a little from the smile that I already have if I wasn't also feeling intense second-hand embarrassment from a giant fictional turtle. But hey, <laughs> I still enjoyed it. For the rest of the voices, well, seeing as Seth Rogen was playing a self-obsessed ego-driven Donkey Kong, he felt pretty natural at it, like he was just, just playing himself. Honestly, I think Luigi and Toad probably had the most 
meh voices of all the main cast. Apart from the fact that Toad was given a lot of annoying lines and one-liners, both of them have pretty irreplaceable game voices. And I don't think either character was so involved in the story that I was able to get used to and get behind the new ones. Cranky Kong had the same issue, but even worse, because that guy didn't sound cranky or like Kong. I think this might be the only thing that the DK cartoon has of this film. He's a genius, cause I am, cause I'm cranky. <laughs> yeah. This voice was pretty annoying. My last main concern was how the film would handle references, and as a hyperbolic but also kind of not example, I bet that at some point a penguin would get thrown off a cliff. Spoiler, that didn't happen. Fan surface, I think, could have the potential to maybe be a contentious topic in of itself in how it's used in major franchise pieces like this film. And this is partly why I had such a problem with how it might be used here. Especially because of the kind of films and TV coming out nowadays, it can feel like random cameos and Easter eggs are a cheap way to give an audience a little bit of precious dopamine by jangling a shiny bell in front of them, like some kind of cat, getting them distracted for a few seconds so they can forget how bad everything else there watching is. However, as observed in Plato's Cave, it is a floor of people that we just want to turn around and look at the pretty lights for once. So I'm not going to sit here and act like I didn't enjoy hearing some familiar tracks from the games, seeing a dry bones fall apart or even seeing, you know, Koopa Trooper get turned into dry bones, that was fun. Or hearing the sweet tones of a shy guy's meow. I think in a worst film, having as many easter eggs as the Mario movie does could easily be argued against as a lazy attempt to get people who were actually born in a time where Donkey Kong games were being released to like it, or at least it could give that impression. And and though I'm sure all the references and little bits do add to the film's form value somewhat, I don't think it's enough to really be super criticisable. Sure, in like the first five minutes, there are references stuffed into basically every second. Enough to expand the dongs of people who make top 200 hidden secrets and things that you s didn't see missed in the Mario movie videos. Quite a few obvious, like a cameo by Charles Martinet, some very obscure ones like Spike from Wrecking Crew, and maybe all the Punch-Out character picks because Mario was the original ref, or things in the middle like the GameCube startup sound or Pauline as the mayor. But it kind of takes a break after that, and the film uses references to the Mario franchise, usually in a way where it's in the background, so it depends on how closely you're looking at each scene or in a way that serves the plot, creating one of the most satisfying moments where, during the big Rainbow Road chase, Mario gets away from the Blue Cooper's big car by replicating the course skip from Mario Kart 64. If you can make something like this that actually means something in the plot, make it so that it's recognisable to people who know, but also not give things a massive self-indulgent fanfare to let the audience know that this is an acceptable time where they can remember, I would call that a successful reference in my book. If you know, you know, and if you don't know, you're not just confused as to why the film has stopped over and jumped in a car and made a really big deal of it. The only thing I didn't really like that kind of falls into this category was the use of real music, and mostly because of how much it reminded me of a Marvel film. I don't understand why, when for most of the time they use quite frankly awesome sounding remix of some game tracks and some really nice originals, like props to the composers on this, because this is, soundtrack is great, that they'd also do a very modern movie thing and just put generic retro music in. The songs weren't bad or anything, and I'm not saying real music doesn't have a place in film or animated film, but it just doesn't really fit with Mario. It doesn't fit the timelessness, the sort of individuality that Nintendo seems to create. Sonic would do that, but not Mario. Mario music is just great in general though, isn't it? But let's face it, if you went to see the movie, you'll probably be aware of most of the Easter eggs and the little background stuff anyways. It might be a bit Odyssey-centric with Pauline as the mayor, the Sand Kingdom in the background of a montage, and basically Bowser's whole plan. But it also has some moments and retains the same colourful and fun atmosphere of the games to please the very oldest of fans, just like I thought it would. The two audiences for this film, I think they're mainly going to be aiming for people who grew up with Sunshine and Sick and or 64, or young children, so they're going for people who are older than me, and people who are younger than me, so I'm kind of caught in the middle in this 
this Mario thing here. But I think that this does also help the film to appeal to all ages, uh, and not even just with the references either, uh, but there were a couple of nods to Galaxy and, well, the sun was in a few shots, so I think that might count. So basically what I'm trying to say is this film was fun, and I don't really think it needs to be anything else. I've mentioned all my concerns through the video, and even while watching it, I still had some reservations for quite a bit of time. The real music I mentioned, I just didn't really like at all. And even hearing about the use of the Super Shows theme did make me cringe a little. And although that panned out pretty okay in the film, I think hearing the DK rap in there might have been a bit too much. At least that's kind of what I wrote down in my notes after. But I'm not really sure how much of a problem I would have had with both those themes if I wasn't feeling so cynical and had such low expectations going in. I think it's pretty amazing, to be honest, that I went in feeling like I was probably going to come out and be tearing this film apart. But I left in high spirits and with a smile on my face. The fact that after I got over all the worries of the film being bad, I could just sit back and have a good time, I think that is a pretty good thing for a Super Mario Brothers film to achieve. If you want to look at it one way, I think this film definitely broke the ice for any future Mario films, because let's face it, there's definitely going to be another one with how much money it's going to make, like Nintendo are performing some kind of Infinite Lives glitch, or perhaps any other series that they try to turn into films. They've had their one movie with a bare bones plot and little character development that can stand up with its fun factor, its respect for the source material and the novelty of it being a good video game film without flossing, that has managed to overcome all of the doubt about it. I think a sequel could really have potential considering how much stuff there is in the Mario universe. Like, maybe they could set it in Sarasaland, have it Luigi more? Maybe they go on vacation and the plot goes from there? I don't know. Wario will probably be in it though, and he will be played by Danny DeVito. And I think that's something that we can all look forward to. But seriously, this film ripped its ending straight from Descendants 1. A shy guy sniffler speaks real language, and the most beloved of all Mario characters, Bluster Kong, was not in it. Zero out of ten, and now I'm going back to play Mario's fucking time machine. It's times like this that make me proud to be a bully. Oh, um, I forgot to mention, Mario hating mushrooms? Not funny, okay? That's quite possibly the cheapest child laugh bait I've ever heard in my life, and it felt very illumination. And it didn't even matter anyways, they brought it up like twice, and then that was it. And although the super song sh- And although the super sh- And although the super sh- sh <laughs> And although the super sh-, sh Super show shong. Uh, oh god. And although the shoe is. Oh my god. And although the super show shong is. Oh my god. I said shong. <laughs> and although the super show song. It, oh my god. I nearly got that right. And although the super show shong is in the fucking game. Super show shong. That's what I was about to say. It's the super show. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Do the Mario swing. And although the Super Show song is in the film, unfortunately the characters did not do the Mario during the end credits. But at least they did have the Gusty Garden Galaxy music. Hmm, maybe that could be a plot for Mario 3.